PhD in Progress, Episode 20. This week, we speak to Ben McNeil from the University of New South Wales and founder of Thinkable.org. We discuss the deficit and creativity of science research and the thrills of secret learning. Let's go. trying to keep on the same track but I can start it. Oh, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Whatever. That's easy. Okay. All right. Ready? Welcome back to the PhD in Progress podcast where we talk about your education, your career, and your life. I'm Jason. I'm Nick Hill. And today we've got a special guest with us, Ben McNeil. How you doing? Yeah, really well, guys. Yeah? All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah. So I guess the first thing is, um, Ben, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you're currently doing. Um, yeah, sure. And uh, what brought you here? Yeah, well, well, so my, I'm a um, I'm a long time oceanographer and climate scientist. I uh, did a PhD uh, in Australia in the late '90s, and then after that, I came to Princeton for a postdoc for a few years uh, in the early 2000s. And then I've been a faculty at the University of New South Wales in Sydney for the last 10 years, uh, and growing a research group, doing what you do as, a, as an academic, you know, trying to push the bounds of knowledge. At, you know, try and find time to do that, and at the same time, build a team and teach as well, and obviously, try and get funding to yeah. do all of that stuff. Which is a big part of today's talk. Uh, yeah. We'll be discussing how you obtain funding in a way, um, but maybe more about the the societal pressures of getting funding, the the challenges to it, and why it's hard, particularly in science, to get good funding to good labs. All right. uh, and in, in addition to, you know, how to get funding, I think we'll also touch upon um, sort of the implications of, of funding. So, you know, in a, in a case where funding isn't constrained, uh, how does that affect uh, the kind of research you do or the kinds of problems you think about? Um, so uh, we brought Ben in because uh, I saw an article in Ars Technica that got pretty popular. It was, uh, what was it called? Is there a creative... Oh, is there a creativity deficit in science, I believe? Yeah. Yes, all right, nailed it. (laughs) Um, And it was really interesting because it was things that we had talked about, at least me and my grad student friends, we we discussed this in general, but you really put it in great terms and had a nice outline. So maybe you can talk about that article a little bit. Yeah, sure. I I think as a scientist, uh, you want to, I mean, I'm passionate about, what we do is we want to make discovery, right? That's the that's the bread and butter is to make discovery, uh, at, to to help humanity generally. Um, to do that, to to make discovery or to be innovative means taking risks. If you aren't taking risks in a field or in a, in an in even an industry, then you're not innovating, right? So there's a if you're not pushing those bounds, then you're actually not. Uh, creating new knowledge and new uh, new potential for new things, right? So w- that article in Ars Technica was really trying to pinpoint... I'm actually writing a book about it, which is the sort of basis for it, but uh, there's, a, you know, the, the, there's the basis of what are the demographics of discovery? Not just demographics in terms of age or what have you, but the demogra- well, how do you make big ideas happen? You know, do they come from, uh, you know, having a lot of time? Do they come from uh, having uh, no no knowledge bias, this psychological bias that's that create that creeps up on people when they're in their in their older sort of incarnations of their careers? Um, is it because you have a uh, you're connected, highly connected with across cross faculties and cross disciplines? There are all these things play into uh, uh, are really important in terms of. Uh, creating the the uh, conditions to which discovery happens. Now, when I talk about discovery, there's incremental discovery and then there's big discovery, and this is this is the difference. Incremental discovery is what the sci- what science metrics are today. Right. So, to get funding, you need to publish papers. So, in other words, if I'm if I'm given a um, uh, a card and that says you you know in order to get X dollars, you need to produce X output. 
And the output is not necessarily a discovery. It's actually the, a publication. That's the metric, right, to which a, a, a new bit of knowledge is, is introduced into the world. But here's the thing, is that I can either, I can either say to myself, um, to get that bit of money, I can, I can uh, do low-hanging, safe, conventional, incremental work from established ideas and get output, right? Um, or I can take a risk and say, look, I've got this big idea. No one thinks, I, it's, no one thinks it's possible, but I think I've got a shot, right? And, but it takes, let's say, a year or two, you know, to, to do that. Um, and actually, in some cases, it takes much longer. But uh, you've got a dilemma there, right? So you've got to, you've got to actually choose, as a scientist, what pathway uh, you want to take. You know, and I guess there's not, it's not just one pathway. A lot of people say, look, you have to do the incremental, and then you sort of test the bounds on 20% of your time. You do these bigger, you know, sort of out there. But that's not really a great way to do it, but that's probably the, how we do it today. So this Ask Technical essay is all about trying to, cre- to, to talk about, you know, what are the demographics and the conditions necessary for us as scientists uh, and for society to support scientists make big discoveries, because that's what we want. B, how, how um, the funding system and the ecosystem around funding scientists and awarding us, that is completely broken in the sense of creating the conditions necessary for that big discovery, risky discovery, particularly for younger researchers, because that's where most discoveries come from, and we can probably talk about that too. Yeah. It, it seems interesting because the, this problem with the funding seems... Uh, to mirror in a way how businesses are run, right? So a business wants to minimize the risk. They want to do incremental. Maybe uh, maybe they might have an offshoot project that they're willing to fund if they see that the risk is what, big enough to pay off. Um, in science, it seems as though that doesn't happen as much nowadays, but you listed some, exper- or some, uh, some examples in the past where that has happened. Yeah, um, well... Well, it's it's happened. I mean, there's so many examples, yeah. right? So pretty much every Nobel Prize comes from um, an idea or a direction which seemed crazy, right? So that other senior peers thought were crazy. So in the current system, you get vetted by senior peers, right? So you're you're essentially an idea has to be. Um, what do they call? They they say it's uh, workable or doable or feasible. Right, so there, there's an outcome to when you pitch a project. Now that that is by implication meaning that it's going to be incremental, because if you're if, if someone's already selling telling you that there's going to be yeah, some sort of output that's beneficial, then you're not taking a big risk. Does that if that yeah. makes sense, right? So uh, I guess the, the the thing is is that uh, for us as 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 scientists. And as reviewers, because we review the projects as well, um, we actually have to s- sort of step back and, and, and try and really assess how we want to um, uh, s- say no to, to a given project um, because it has big implications of, of the ecosystem of discovery, right? So um, in terms of the, your, your, your uh, question of, of these examples in the past, I mean, a classic example of... Of you know um, this, the idea of pushing the bounds is. I even go outside traditional natural science and go to Tim Berners Lee. Right, you know, Tim Berners Lee, um, in not, in the late eighties, he had this idea to. Well, the internet was only connecting between one server and one computer. There was no actual web at the time. He had this idea. He was at CERN at the Physics National Physics Laboratory in in in, uh, in Europe. He had this crazy idea that he'd create this hypertext system that would link machines and servers around the world, right? And this HTTP. Heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so what do you do as a young researcher? He, he had to pitch the project and say, look, I want to work on this for the next six months to his boss. Now, luckily, the, the boss was very receptive to that. He, he, he famously, Mike Sendel, his name was, he famously wrote back and said, vague about the idea, vague but exciting. And then, but he continued to work on that for the next six months, and that's where the web came, right? But a vague but exciting idea would never get funded 
in the NOH or NSF system. Yeah, and here's I think that's here's the where the breakdown is. What was his boss? What was his boss? His boss, uh, Mark Sendel. Mark, Mark Sendel. Sendel. I'm guessing he was already fairly accomplished and had funding enough himself to yep. okay this project. But yep. for a, an early career professor who hasn't had that success or those breakthroughs already, how can you try to take that risk without you know, damaging your lab because you can't have the funding for it? Um, and that's been the big problem And when I think of this deeply. It's just, it, it's this constant, is it positive or negative feedback? I don't even know which one because it's coming from both sides, but the culture that it builds is just something that's unable to sustain itself in a great innovation manner. And that's, that's why you need to build a new, a new metric, right? Because right now the metric is only about your publication record. The idea itself, as much as we think it's good that the idea is, is rated and the innovation potential it's mostly on your track record that that, the re- that, that you get funding. Um, now that's not to say every, you know, every piece piece of money within, particularly within uh, philanthropy, does that. Um, but it's really important to have that track record. And as you say, you don't have a track record when you're a younger scientist. So how do you? It, it's a it's a it's a catch twenty two. But I want to point out the importance of philanthropy here yes, and how it's actually changed um not always changed but but changed in most cases um towards the government system so generally speaking uh if, if, you know 30 years ago 20 years ago f- philanthropic um, foundations used to fund risky projects and younger researchers there's a famous example of dennis slammon this is what i wrote about in the article uh who's a, who is a uh, oncologist ucla he was a young, mostly inexperienced, a younger researcher, had this crazy idea to map, at, in the late 80s, to map the, um, uh, the genes for tumours. That's a just simple, simple idea. At the time, establishment was all about chemotherapy, targeted chemotherapy and other, other um, treatments. Uh, and they all rejected his note. Like they said, that's, that's not a great idea. No, it seems pretty crazy today to think of yeah, that. Is, I mean, but, but he had struggles, so he couldn't get funding. Right? This, is, this, is, this is what we're talking about. Couldn't get funding. So he fortunately found funding uh, through, through philanthropists. So there was, I think, the Revlon Foundation, and there was a, also um, a, another benefactor, a woman who was a high net wealth individual who, who gave seed money for him. Now, that seed money really was a game changer. In the end, I won't go through the whole story, but in the end, uh, he found this, this discovery that there was a certain gene that, that, that kick-started uh, a certain type of breast cancer, highly lethal type of breast cancer, mm-hmm. and they found a protein to block it. Uh, so, and it was one of the biggest, it probably still is one of the top discoveries uh, and breakthroughs in cancer in, yeah, I mean, in the last 20 years. Like in my undergrad cancer class, that was the first, not even cancer, it was just general biology. Yeah. And we start learning about cancer, and HER2 is the first yeah, thing sure. we basically learn about genetics of cancer. It's, and to think that that was caused because, not because of uh, government funding, um, but philanthropy, just an individual who was able to give that much money or people who were able to raise enough money to make that happen. That's yeah. crucial. I, so I think uh, another part of this issue is that um, nowadays, more and more so, um, there's a lot more personal risk intertwined with the scientific risk, right? So, um, you know, if you're trying to make it as an academic, um, your career depends on um, your publication record and the success of your projects. And so that's why, you know, people tend to choose the safer projects because their careers depend on it. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how this coupling sort of emerged um, where, you know, it's... Uh, the the failure is not just a failure of the science, but also a personal failure, um, and how that maybe changes some of these um, incentive structures. Well, as scientists, we need to live, right? You can't <laughs> survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you need a, you need an income. I mean, we, we're we're not about money. We're not really in it for the money. Most scientists um, we want to live. 
So in the but so once uh, in the, it was the it was the eighties which changed. So before in the nineteen sort of sixties uh, to to eighties, they used to have block grants. Now you know what a block grant is. So they used to essentially not have a competitive system of grants allocated by the government. The government would give institutes block money, and then the institutes themselves would divvy it out to individual researchers, and that would actually um, uh, help uh, seed fund a lot of young researchers. Now, there's problems with that too, but the, and, and, and a lot of the problems came from um, you know, a highly uh, politicised, let's say, institute who had personal issues against others and you had political wars yeah. and what have you. So they sort of said, well, let's institute a competitive grant system whereby everyone has the same shot. And so there's a big pool of money and you'll pitch for the one. And it's, and it's great. Um, that it, it's a great ideal. But the, the consequence of doing that is that, um, the, the, is that it, this, the system of competitive grants, when you're competing against someone who has you know, a far greater track record, because innovation is so hard to judge, like I've been in research for 17 years and I'm, as, as I say, useless as a doormat in picking to innovation, honestly. Um, uh, I'm good at judging what good science has been done, but not good necessarily at picking what's gro- going to be great. Right? No one actually is very well. So in that system, um, it ch- instead of choosing on innovation, they they ch- tend to s- sort of shift back to a psychological. Um, he's done great, or he or she has done great stuff before. That means he'll probably do some good stuff in the future, right? So they've shifted back to the conservatism, right? Mm-hmm. And because the system, that competitive system, has created the nucleus for which we can survive, you have to be part of that system to be, as you say, to to live. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you actually do have the, uh, you tend to be safer and say, look, I've got five papers I can think of now that I can publish. Not they're incremental; they're still going to be read a little bit, but they'll be incremental. They're the ones I'm going to sort of pursue. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a really problem. It's, it's a problem. And that's where philanthropy was so important. But that has changed now. So they're not all philanthropy has changed, though. There's really some really great ones out there who still do it, but they're really niche. And a lot of them have moved to the grant system, whereby peers select, mm-hmm. which is crazy. In my mind, it's absolutely crazy to, to have a system whereby it's moving towards the government system where we know... It, the, the government system is great for, as I say, established incremental work, which we need too. But we do need that other risky, creative, young researcher, blue sky ideas. Mm-hmm. And it used to be like that. And generally speaking around the world, it's, it has not become that. Uh, and, and that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the institution that comes to mind is Bell Labs. Um, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's corporate, but it's also kind of this old school philanthropy model where... It, would, it was a large pool of money allocated specifically for this kind of high-risk, high-reward research. Um, and a lot of great things came out of Bell Labs. You know, fMRI, um, you know, a lot of modern neuroscience um, was has its foundations there, um, I, and other fields as well, so communications. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, And, you know, you look at today's world, and there's no company really, except maybe Google, um, that's funding... This kind of research. So, you know, to what extent do you think corporations have a role? Um, as you know, not philanthropic mm. organizations, but like, you know, for profits. I think there is a massive role for them to play. Look, they've they've shifted out of research, not necessarily because they have to. Um, it's because it was very expensive and long term proposition. So, to have Bell Labs and have a the the infrastructure, the labs, and the people. In a in a in an environment is really expensive, um, and the payback is long, in terms of long term, and so it, commercially it's not doable. But here's the thing: is today in today's world, you don't have to build the lab. You can actually source those people from wherever they are around the world virtually, and it's because it's about knowledge, remember, and they can be working wherever they are. And you can be in contact with them and sharing knowledge and having knowledge exchange with them, and you won't have that all that huge amounts of capital and upkeep that you need. So, in other words, a company who, by the way, is always want to be innovative. They always want to. They're investing a lot in innovation, but they're doing it 
generally in house. So they've sort of the 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 the, uh, the the links between the businesses and organisations and universities, for example, is still huge. There's still huge barriers. They have local connections. They can't. You know, there's not really a system whereby they can connect uh, easily with knowledge wherever that is. You know, whether it's in um, Iceland, Australia, or you know, in the US. So. What's amazing about Tim Berners-Lee little Tim Berners-Lee's little breakthrough model of, of the internet is that we can actually you can do that, and that's what we're trying to do with Thinkable is 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 build a place where people can tap and source and fund the most creative, innovative minds, and they don't have to be building a lab to bring them in. They can do it where you guys are in your lab here in Princeton. You could have someone, you know, funding you from Australia. You know, so I guess there's a whole new world, and so I totally agree um, that the the this whole the whole private model, if you will, I think is is going to see an enormous change in the next 20, 10, 20 years, and it's hugely exciting for being in research because you know for us it's about um, it's about uh, pushing the bounds of knowledge and doing doing creative things in the lab or in the field. And having support beyond that system that we've talked about, that pretty broken system that, that's in the in, in that, that's in the government, is really great. Um, and, and I think there's gonna, you're going to see a really explosion. Mm-hmm. And there's all these other labs like uh, indie labs that, that are popping up, that biohacks and you know I don't know if you know all these these, these organs these groups who are c- creating community labs, mm-hmm. whereby it's not just institutions who are, have the lab now. It's you know they're, they're sort of communal lab facilities. And anyone can come in, and um, and there's a lab manager, and and they can come in and create, you know, and, and innovate. It's a, it's a whole new world, and it's really exciting. Yeah, I sure, agree. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been uh, following some ind- independent scientists on Twitter. Um, you know, QB3 in the Bay, for example, is one of these mm-hmm. like shared resource spaces. So there's a lot of things like that popping up. Um, so you mentioned Thinkable. Like, um, can you explain a little bit more about what, what that is and how it provides a solution to this problem? Sure. Uh, so there's a few there's a few massive pain points um, as a researcher, uh, and a lot of your listeners will sort of relate to this, particularly younger researchers. We've talked about funding, but the other one is is how science connects with society generally. Um, now this is hyperly sensitive in my space, and this is why it's sort of come to a, to a to a head with me um, in climate science, there's a huge disconnect between what the society thinks is happening and what think the the th- think I guess the academics are saying or scientists are saying and what is actually happening. I, I, I can't even joke about that. I want yeah. to make a joke. No, no, it's true. Like so, not, oh, well, um, yeah. and, and I think I I started thinking about this a long time ago because I get a lot of hate mail and all sorts of stuff. And then, I, but then I'd start publishing my work in the traditional format, and then other people would take my message, well, the message that was wrong, and they would put it out there. Like it would be exaggerated, or it wouldn't be, or whatever it may be, and and that's not good either, you know. So I I wanted to, you know, and in terms of engaging your science with the world. There's not really a great format. You guys are doing this with your podcast, and that's that's really great. And I think the next level would be to translate and use slides and inter- and video to make people really engage with the science. And now with all the tools we have, we can. So Thinkable is a way to try and bring uh, a, a, an element of translating what we do as specialists into a way which is um, into a way which is understandable to a wider audience. Not in the sense of, they say, you so-called dumbing it down. It's actually elevating the conversation to a level which is, for us as scientists, taking it back and saying, why are we doing this? You know, what, what's the goal? You know, what, why is it innovative? And what would be the outcome if it happened, if this result was you know, positive or negative? So I guess it's important for us as scientists to always do that, to, to always sort of uh, take back a notch and say, what are we actually trying to achieve in our own science, whether, whether it's basic science or applied science? Uh, and, but, and when we communicate um, that to a wider audience and other scientists can understand, um, 
that really helps on many levels, trust with society, but also collaboration with other scientists. Um, now, I'll tell you another story, if I can. I'm, I'm, I'm talking oh, a lot. I'm talking no, a lot. This is, I'm actually talking a lot, so sorry. This is great. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sure the American audience is going to love your accent. Like, <laughs> so, way more than my Jersey one, so, so fine. But sorry, I, so there's, um, uh, I have a couple of, uh, I'm passionate about science generally. I just love it. And I, I've always wanted to understand science broadly. But uh, as, I, as I talked to you before, if I pick up a science or nature uh, magazine, and I look at the biology, and I look at supposedly a high-impact, wide, widely read journal, I would have no idea what's going on. Um, and one of my mentors is, uh, has been uh, Peter Doherty, who, who's a, he won the Nobel Prize in, uh, in, in medicine in 1996 um, for T cells and viruses, and he's an immunologist. And each year we sort of catch up, um, and we talk about science generally and how, how, how things are. And he, he's always fascinated with what, you know, what's happening in climate. And so I said, oh, look, I'll send you an article, a couple of articles of mine, supposedly in those the science and the PNAS sort of high-impact journals. Um, and he, 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 we, we caught up after he, I sent them, and he said, look, Ben, I have um, those articles you've, you, you sent, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, the the language, the jargon, the complexity, the specialization. You know, can you just talk to me in sort of plain English about what you've done, like what your research is? And this was two years ago. And, and I thought to myself, that is insane. That someone like, on, you know, his, on his sort of knowledge and intellectual capacity and his level would not understand something like what I was saying in my science, I think is simple science, but what he had no idea. And it would be the, the complete, as I said, I would have no idea what, in his specialist journals, what he's talking about. That is hugely problematic because the biggest discoveries generally come, not always, but generally come from cross-fertilizing ideas. Oh, definitely, right? yeah. So if we can't converse, if you and I cannot converse about what we've generally done into and maybe even methodology because a lot of it's overlap science is is a big it's a big tent here um if we can't converse and sort of understand then we're limiting opportunities for discovery so m- the other big pain point is this hyper specialization that's come because of this metric system so because we publish in these specialist journals and the language that only 50 people around the world that would probably understand what you know i'm talking about that's so in the digital age, funnily enough, we're becoming more disconnected with a wider audience. So we're becoming more hyper-connected with a very core field, but becoming more disconnected with a wider audience. That's crazy and problematic. So what we want to... So Thinkable is helping, hopefully helping that, right, in that the sense of creating video abstracts. And a lot of journals are doing this now, whereby you publish an article and then they say, give us a three-minute overview of what you've done. Uh, in, 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 in no jargon, uh, and then we can publish that with associated with the paper. So Thinkable is a place for a researcher to come to and start sharing that, that type of, in that format. So taking it up a level whereby anyone can understand. And I'm just loving it because I'm learning about things that uh, I'd never learn, I'd never understand from people I trust. Right? They're, they're other academics, they're other knowledge They've, they've, been in, they've been doing investing in their brains in that field for 10 years or 20 years. And so it's really, it's amazing. And it empowers us as researchers um, because we've, you know, it's a long effort, it's a long, hard effort to do what we do, um, but at the same time, fascinating. So you, you can actually now share your knowledge and grow support, intellectual support and knowledge support, but also financial support. So down the road, you, you essentially, instead of having a, let's say, a Twitter following and it's, it's, a, it's based on 140 characters and you're not really learning much other than go and see this link, um, you, you can share insights in your field, whether it's in the lab or, or a poster or a paper or anything in your field, um, to, to, your, to your, what we're calling sponsors, and they subscribe to you. So it's a, it's a patronage model for, in science whereby... They're connecting with your science. They're wanting to learn. Could be a business, a philanthropist, or other scientists, or individual. Um, and and I think that when you create that system of support and trust, 
you can, and it's a new metric, you can take risks. Because those, those supporters of yours don't necessarily need to see the pub PDF that you want, you know, the, 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 the article that you have to publish, that incremental article that in the traditional journal. They just want to share and be transparent and open. They want to understand what you're doing. Take a risk. If you fail, that's great because that's innovation. You know, that's, that's how science works. But just be transparent about it. If you're transparent about it, then then that's that's all good. So I mean, that's what we're trying to. It's do. awesome that it provides a new, I guess, abstract of sorts. It, you have your abstract for the paper, but now it allows you another vehicle to convey similar, if not the same exact information, that is way more accurate than the internet would go. So, like one one thing I see is that uh, on Reddit, which you might be familiar mm-hmm. with, the, there's the subreddit called Science. And there they do a decent job of one person might post an article with a very sensationalist uh, title, right? And then you usually have to go to the comments to get some clarification. Uh, And at that point, it's typically up to the the commenters to, to, uh, I guess, comment on the article itself. But usually they have to support it with links to other papers and kind of air quote, dumb it down, but make it more accessible to people. Uh, and and I think that's been very helpful for internet discussion of science, in a way, and I, I think thinkable is another way to approach that. I would, I would say, though, that it, when you said it just take your abstract and just the same information, turn it into, you know, turn that information into a, a video abstract, um... That uh, the abstracts that we we, we uh, that we write today are still completely alien to outside your field. They're supposed to be they're oh, yeah. supposed to be in plain English, right? And they're supposed to be this is what you've done. But we we have it's shifted a bit from the what it's the the the, pr- the principle of what an abstract was supposed to be to be more more jargon, right? And, and acronyms and all sorts of stuff. So well, I guess, how much of that do you think is because at, at one point a few decades ago. When I studied molecular biology, I could understand basically everything in molecular biology. Now, post-genomics era, there's no way I can know every single gene and every single pathway in the cell. And then how can uh, a marine biologist know cell biology in every aspect? It's just... So how do you think this is going to go as science uh, research gets more specialized because it has to in order to make certain prog- progress. It, well, for sure, we, we have to still publish in the specialist journals. It's just taking that information back a notch in terms of the overview, the three-minute thesis of what this research was about. Right. So um, every bit of research, where how specialized, I don't care what it is, you should be able to translate that into a three-minute you know, uh, elevator pitch. Yeah. Like, period. If you can't do that, that's that, no, that's my challenge to, I think, most of these, most of uh, PhD students and postdocs in my group, to do that, to do that is such an, going to be such an important part of the future of science. Because grant, even the traditional system of um, public funding is requiring much more openness and much more knowledge exchange because that's public are paid for it. It's so, not even just important science. It's for anyone doing probably any job, uh, especially if they're at a higher level of not just basic education or skill. They have to be able to translate what they do. Um, like some friends who do coding for certain programs, like they tell me, one in particular is really going to tell me why his method of coding is a little better than what anyone else does. And that's important, um, especially especially because we need to, we can't be there. We can't be doing the research on our own. Uh, it's not like everyone goes in the lab and repeats all these experiments that are written up in papers. It's not that environment anymore. Just to go back to what you, you said, when we, before this, the interview, you, you talked about your own research and it was all, it was fascinating, right? It was, you talked about gene expression and how that could flip organs around in the body, right? Yeah. That's fascinating. So, um, to, to even just to talk about that in general principle, in general terms, and share that, let's say, with a couple of slides and an overview and, a, and some audio. Now you can do it with the screencast. You can do all sorts of stuff. People want to know that. You know, yeah. I, I want to know that. There's heaps of people who want to know that, and they'll want to connect with you around that because they they will trust you because you you have this 
over time you'll build up this repertoire of knowledge and you'll be part of you know an institution or an organization which also has trust involved with it but it's 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 a it's a connector right it's a connector with those knowledge seekers out there that are many people don't think there are but there are millions and millions of people now subscribing to um, science communication channels, which not from scientists, from science communicators, because people are fascinated with science, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter or, uh, or YouTube. There are mil- tens of millions of subscribers. Right? And I think for researchers, for us and academics, we need to start doing that because that'll give us a, a really fantastic support base and also we'll be able to get ideas from other people who we'd never traditionally got ideas from. It should definitely be part of the job now. Like, I, I don't know why it seems like... It seems that it's important, yet it's still not a requirement. It's funny. The, our university, University of New South Wales, has now... We have a very large digital imprint of Facebook, and um, you know we have a media office... Uh, sorry, a TV lab. You can go and um, talk, and they produce videos around your research. But now, for, for actually, uh, to, to, for, for promotion, the engagement, so knowledge engagement, or they call it knowledge exchange and knowledge transfer, that's now um, part of the metrics that's of cool. not just publications and what have you. So that's the future. So I think that's a really important insight that uh, we're, the, the world's moving to in science. And so whoever's great at communicating science and engaging people beyond their field Doing great science, but engaging what they do beyond their field is really going to it's going to it's going to be great for their careers, generally. So, how do you get these big organizations like grant grant agencies and large universities um, to start caring about these metrics like engagement? Well, I think I, I think uh, it comes from the researcher. To be honest with you, it's going to take time for the big institutions to un- to, to sort of um, get around. I mean, I, I sort of find it like it, it's it's like uh, when Facebook and Twitter started. Um, they, you know, a lot of organisations and businesses were going, "What's this social media stuff?" And then, "What? That seems a bit crazy. Why would we do this?" And now, this like a massive part of their system. But it was, so it was sort of an organic up. It was up. You know, it wasn't. It was bottom up rather than top down. So I think as as this sort of, as the as the knowledge ecosystem. That we're trying to build at Thinkable evolves and elsewhere, um, then it, it, it's it's inevitability that this will be supported by institutions. That's my feeling. It'll take time though, um, and it also takes time for us to really develop the communication skills uh, um, as researchers. We're not used to that type of format. I mean, we do every 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 year we go present, right? We give fifteen minute talk at at a, at a meeting. You know, so the slides are there. We give talks all the time. Now we have we have a you know screen capture, free screen capture tools where you could easily do a three minute, what's a three minute version of that fifteen minutes that you gave you know, for a bit of a wider audience. You know that that's doable, but it it, it does take time to. Why am I doing this? Is this important? You know, like you guys, but why are you guys doing this this podcast? You know. Um, you know, you've got many reasons. I've got my own reasons for why you'd be doing it, but it has to come back to that. That you know, is this important? And yes, here, here's why it's important. The future of science is not just going to be around a publication list. That's a given. Uh, it's going to be around how you engage others beyond your field and society. Universities are going to be like some universities now are going to be really compelled to those sort of. Types of types of scientists and academics who can actually engage that way, um, but beyond that, collaboration. Because so you, the traditional system is about publications, and um, you want to have as many collaborators as possible. So the better you are at communicating what you do, many better you are at connecting with others beyond your field, the better likelihood you have many co-authorships on many papers. So it's it's actually there's many different ways and and, and means of why communication is important, and then there's it's the public good. That we're we're actually connecting society, you know, with knowledge, and they're helping us to to engage. That's great. A scientific lit, literary, literary um, society. That's great. You know. So to I guess start wrapping up a little bit, um, but still staying unthinkable a little bit. So who should be signing up for Thinkable? Who is it postdocs? Is it grad students? Is it professors? Is it 
someone just interested in science or whatever research subject? Is it just science? It, it, it's a, it's about science. So any field in science. So you could be you know an astronomer or a cell biologist or um, even the social sciences we're talking about. It's not we're not we're agnostic on knowledge. We want anyone who's creating new knowledge um, in generally that space. So the the anyone any researcher can join. It's, you know, thirty seconds, and they have to affiliate themselves with an organisation. So generally, you know, we've got. Uh, um, 1,400 uh, researchers uh, who signed up for, from all over the world. They're starting to share ideas, but they've, right now they just build a profile and they're, they're trying to feel what is this about because it's quite new. Yeah. Um, but we've had you know, early success. Uh, we've had uh, Martin Rees, who's a cell biologist, a biochemist. You know, he's he's done what um, what. Uh, the platform is used for. He's sharing knowledge. So he's shared about um, 14 different, um, we call them ideas, but little snapshots of knowledge, whether it be a past paper, a poster, a lab lab interviews with PhD students. Um, I learned about what's a free radical. I mean, I didn't really know what a free radical was. I sort of had a vague idea, but he told me more about fr- free radical and how that damages our health. Um, and he raised uh, he's raised nearly fourteen thousand um, dollars on the platform, um, and it's so it's a monthly subscription. It's not a project based. It's not like Kickstarter where you sort of have to put massive amounts of effort into a short term project and then you have to come back another few months to get some more money or what have you. This is an ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. It's so it's more like Twitter, but it's more for knowledge, uh, whereby you build your audience. So it's an ongoing process, and and it's really. Um, uh, the first, the first things you'll do after you, you you share an idea, you'll just share it to your traditional social networks, and then we help share that. Then the institution, once they come on board, they ha- they also then market as well, so that you get a wider audience. Okay. Um, and just one one example. Uh, so Martin Reese, this biochemist, he, if you look at if you look at uh, he he did a video abstract of a paper he published this year in I think it was Free Radical Biology and Medicine it was, and if you look at the title, it's one of those insane four sentence titles which have you know uh, all these compounds and stuff in it that no one understand and you know he translated that into a three minute little presentation a powerpoint slide and the title was a new reason to eat lemons and broccoli oh i was going through the website yesterday and my girlfriend saw this and she's like three reasons to to eat yeah but but, but that gives you that gives you some sort of an idea of how you do it, right? But yeah, and, and grab my my math teacher high school, well, high school high school math teacher girlfriend. She's not in high school, uh, but it grabbed her attention, right? She's not a scientist. Yeah. She's not a grad student. She doesn't know this stuff, but that made her interested. She's like, "What are you looking at?" Like, and that's what we have to try and do, right? That hyper specialist article that we should publish, we still should be publishing those specialist peer reviewed journals, mm-hmm. but take it back a notch, or take it up a notch, I'd actually say. And, and talk about what the implications are and how you did it in a few minutes. And he got, he's got 1,800 views over a few months. Now, that journal article that he, that he published, um, not only he probably paid $2,000 and, you know, someone's paying another $2,000 to access it, uh, aside from that, bro, other, yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah, he was very interested in that in particular. That's, that's like ten podcasts. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not just one podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but he so probably fifty people would have probably read that specialist type. Of, but now he's spread that his his work that he's done on that paper to a much wider audience. So it's really it's really great, and that's and that's what we want to do is 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 really showcase showcase researchers and empower them. To share their knowledge in a way which gives them uh, gives them support in the long term. That's great. So, and so to take risks. <laughs> to take risks. Oh, oh, take risks. Speaking yes. of taking risks, um, I I kind of saw the um, your article in Ars Technica about you know creativity and science as um, you know the the conclusion I drew from that is that you know I wish I had taken bigger risks as a PhD student in my own. Uh, projects and stuff because you know looking back I was in this place where you know my advisor had funding I didn't have to worry about applying for grants or fellowships um, and I, I had uh, you know my advisors kind of hands-off so I had an opportunity to uh, 
basically do what I wanted to do and um, come up with you know novel questions that didn't have the uh, sort of the vetting mechanism that a big grant agency would have. So I had this opportunity, and I feel like maybe I squandered it a little bit. Um, and if I could do it all over again, I would have done something way higher risk because you know. So what was the reason you did that? Um, I mean, you took that route because um, was it was it uh, uh, was it a conscious decision that you took a that sort of a more incremental? You want to call it? Is it, is, is it incremental that work or know, more risky? Or I think what it was is as I came into graduate school, I was inexperienced. I was learning the process of science and how to do rigorous uh, experiments and and all of that. And um, I just sort of assumed that the way it was done was the right way to do it um, without maybe taking the step back or having the experience to know that, wait, you know, this is an opportunity um, to explore something like really crazy or really new. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that only comes with experience, right? You don't know what a good question is until you've learned about your field or have some some depth, right? Um, so, so just to, just to follow that up. Yeah. Most of the, I mean, if you look at the demographics, this is part of the essay, the demographics of Nobel Prizes come from PhD students, 80% of them come from PhD students to 10 years out of your PhD. Right. right? And it comes back to your point of, I guess you said naive, you would, you were saying naive, naivety or sort of, uh, yeah, that sure. you didn't know the, you didn't know what was not possible or, you know. That, that's or, exactly it. But yeah. that's great. And that's fantastic. Because by not having that knowledge, you are able to sort of step into the unknown, right? Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and and that's where I think it's so important for advisors generally to be hands off. Um, you know, to it'd be advisors in the sense of um, once you've taken a path, have a rigor around it, but be very open to completely orthogonal and different types of you know questions. But most people don't have that luxury of having an advisor that is like that. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a very... It's quite rare to have an advisor who is, is hands-off. Postdocs, you know, uh, it's, again, could be, here's the project that we got funded for, this is the this is the area, thanks for the incremental. Right. Right, so I think, um, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's really uh, a hugely important thing and it's actually a great thing to have not, exp- not, not having not had that experience <laughs> and i also think the risk equation is different for a phd student you know if your risky crazy idea fails well you can still publish something incremental in your remaining three or four or five years of graduate school um yeah. you could take an additional year or two um, can i actually also i just had an no, idea no, 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 sorry is that when you say f- you, it failed there is no failure and so, so that knowledge that you had an experiment and it failed, the publishing model doesn't publish uh, negative or um, you know failed results. Right, right? it's right. positive bias. You probably have oh, done sure. a podcast on po- that. Oh, we no, we should. No, that's <laughs> another ten. Podcasts. We'll make a note. Of, we'll make a note of that. <laughs> We're scheduling all hundred episodes. Of this. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so what we want to do on Thinkable, if you think about it, we don't want just positive. You know your published articles. We want the bottom draw stuff that it, that you haven't you sort of left behind. You know the uh, the, the ideas that sort of were half baked and you're never going to get to, but you want others to share because that's really important. Um, you know, Wi-Fi. The the discovery of Wi-Fi came from some Aussie scientists. They were they failed at looking at black holes. They looked in the in the in the early eighties. They failed to detect black holes. In the in the consequence of that failure, in in, in inverted commas, they worked out a new algorithm to to make Wi-Fi crystallized. Right. So, you know, so when we say failure in science, I actually completely there is no failure. It's just new knowledge. That's new mm-hmm. knowledge that really should be out there, and we want to promote that. Right. So on your profile, you can start sharing those ideas. And actually, just to to follow up. We're about to, to launch some uh, some uh, awards for this. We're going to call it the bottom draw um, competition, which oh, actually gives... I'm going to win because yeah. I have so many. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's also a research prize generally, an innovation award that you can win. But exactly for that point is to share this knowledge that is in our bottom draw that has been sitting there and gathering dust 
well, I guess get, 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 whatever on the computer <laughs> digitally. <laughs> but, you know, so the ninety five percent of knowledge isn't out there. So that's what we want to try and share. So by all means, log on to thinkable.org and you know sign up, and you'll hear about these these new pods of of money and competitions where we want to share knowledge and make mm. it and really empower people to, to do that and right. fail. And right. fail. Take it, sounds, it sounds bizarre, but no, fail. No, 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 you're right. I mean, it shows you how much I've sort of bought into this current, like, paradigm, right, that I that I consider that failure. You're absolutely right. It's not failure. I learned a lot from the experience. I've grown as a person and as a scientist from everything that didn't work in the traditional sense. Um, and so... So yeah, I guess to sort of wrap things up, I think um, you know any young PhD students or or whoever you are, listeners, you know take risks because that's how innovation happens. You know you need to be creative, you need to go outside of what your advisor uh, says will get you a paper, uh, because you know otherwise we're we're just going to be stuck in this incremental model. Or it's a machine. Yeah. In first gear. <laughs> And so you're our first professor guest, I think, on this podcast. Is that true? It might be true. Oh, okay. I think it's true. Not our first PhD, but our first professor. As such, you have experience with graduate students. Mm-hmm. What ex- uh, what piece of advice would you give to your second or third year self? PhD self. PhD self. I think it, it goes back to what we're talking about. I think take some measured risks so you can still do the work you want to do but I call it the 20% time 20% of your time work on something that is really out there that's what I I didn't do that and I sort of regret that the other thing I didn't do um, which I did later uh, um, but I think it early the better is to help is to is to learn the the skills and the trade of communicating now that's just a bad experience. Just go out, you know, uh, go and talk to you guys, you know, on radio, on TV, um, write in in a, in a in a op-ed style. That's really important, and that's r- really going to be important for the future. Uh, I can't stress that enough. So, any advice I would give to anyone um, who's a PhD or postdoc is to to start building that profile of communicating. Uh, in their in their in their daily lives, um, not just doing the the, the, the science itself, because um, I think the days of sitting in a lab, um, you know, and being all closed up, and you know, publishing a, a paper in a hyperspecialist journal and, and and getting funding, they're moving towards ending. It's more open, more transparent. More knowledge transfer. Yeah, now you have a Twitter stuff. presence. You give TED talks that are forever, yeah. and it's awesome. I think I've learned so much just watching TED talks. So, uh, and things like that, right? So that's where Thinkable can be. Yeah, no, sure. Thinkable is way better than TED. The thing about TED is that well, it's this like highly curated selection of people oh, yeah. who've been vetted, yeah, and still. like who's to say that they're the expert in the field or the best communicator? Yeah. I mean, I, I what I'm getting at though is that TED still offers a platform for people to talk about. Science. I don't necessarily care about that one person, how great they are, how great they aren't. I, but I still learn things by watching that. Sure. No, I agree that the communication is is, is great. But I don't know. I have I have some issues with. Uh, yeah, it sounds like another yeah, podcast episode. I mean, yeah, because yeah, it's it's really highly produced, right? And it's it it, it, yeah. it immediately gives you. I mean, I would freak out if I was on TED. I reckon all oh, that script and all the production, right? It'd be. I'm more of an organic <laughs> sort of communicator, I'm with you too. <laughs> <laughs> which is great because you can be unthinkable. You can just share it, however you want to share. You don't have to be slick and go to a TV producer. You know? Right, right, exactly. Well, yeah. stop by Thinkable and check it out. Well, thanks so much, guys, yeah, for, for having much. me. It's uh, it's been really great. I actually haven't had a session like that before in terms of we've we've sort of covered a lot of things. We sure you know, did. It's been great. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to edit anything. I don't think. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to follow up? Like, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, I've, the best way is, is the easiest email is ben at thinkable.org. Um, and just uh, send me a note, and I'm, I'm happy to, to give advice and, 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 and even help a little bit with uh, managing how they use Thinkable and also the, the, these potential these prizes and competitions and awards we're putting up soon. Um, so I'd say everyone get on board. The earlier the better, you know. And actually, by the way, to, to in terms of competitions and awards, uh, we, it's a vote 
it's not about I, and the old system is sort of the, the traditional system is you get a senior peers to assess proposals and say yes this, this person is we want everyone to vote on the thinkable so it's researchers and the thinkable community they come on and they they vote not not some you know uh, not peers behind closed doors oh. so it's a completely new way uh, to, to fund research and and it empowers people who are maybe you know are struggling at, at, at trying to get that uh, that funding because they're not the early career or they're taking a really big risk so come on we'd love to help you all right thank you very much yeah, thanks. thanks guys thanks to ben mcneil again for a great show and interview you can reach him at ben at thinkable.org definitely check out thinkable.org to see some current projects and give your own project a shot. If you have any comments or questions, stop by phdinprogress.com slash 20 and leave a comment. You can also email us at feedback at phdinprogress.com or find us on Twitter at phdpodcast. You can also help support the show in a few different ways. The best way is to follow the link in the show notes to leave an honest rating and review in the iTunes store. This goes a long way to spread the word of our show to people who haven't heard about us yet. And if you're interested in helping with the financial aspects of producing and hosting the show, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash phdpodcast, where even a dollar a month helps pay for making each episode. Thanks to Masha E for becoming the latest patron. As always, you can find all this information and everything we discussed today at phdinprogress.com. Why am I doing this? Is this important? You know, like you guys, but why are you guys doing this, this podcast? You know, um... You know, you've got many reasons. I've got my own reasons for why you'd be doing it. 